Hello and welcome to Chunkyard Studios. This is video two of my record lathe restoration. I have taken the, the larger Westrex head off. I have something I need to finish with that before I can really start playing with it. So in the meantime I have another smaller head that I can fine tune the record lathe with and hopefully those some of those settings for the most part will transfer over to the Westrex head when I put that back in place. My goals are to cut with the Webster. I've never cut with the Webster. I've attempted. I did uh, silent grooves and it will cut. It actually doesn't cut too bad but I haven't fed it audio. I'm currently adding an inline fuse with the cutter head and that's to protect it so that the coils don't heat up and blow up the blow up the cutter head. Uh, we're going to start with some smaller some smaller fuses in the 250 milliamp rating and um, work up from there. I was advised from a member of Lathe Trolls to do this. I, I think it's a good idea. I'm going to be feeding it from a tube amp that has a considerable amount of power to it. I've already tested the Webster I didn't do it in a way that I, I think was beneficial. I heard audio, but it was very quiet through the head. The way that people normally test heads like that is they use a plastic cup and they insert it onto the cutting needle so it kind of creates almost like a real crude speaker. And without that solo cup, which I didn't have at the time, you, you really can't, at least at the levels I was testing the head, I could barely hear it. I was really only doing some signal sweeps with it. And I had to kind of go with a higher frequency. We're going to put that head on here. I had to make a special plate because this record lathe has been modified to accept a Westrex head. So the whole carriage assembly here has been moved back an inch or two and that takes the, the heads that it used to fit on it perfectly. That puts them off center with the platter spindle. So I had to make a plate to move it up and over so that it could actually reach the inside of the record. I'm going to get that inline fuse together, mount the plate. I have some plate modifications to do so I can tighten up the adjustments on the carriage without having to take the plate off. And I'm going to hook it up to the amplifier and feed it some audio. These holes look pretty nasty. I'm going to clean them up shortly. I think I'm going to have to widen them. So they're just kind of temporary until I can I can make them a little larger. Uh, these holes at the top I had to put there before for the adjustments to the LPI screw and the head drop. Because of the modifications that have been done to this lathe, I needed to move the cutter head from the center, that's where it normally is mounted, off to the left by a couple of inches so it could cut into all the way to the center of the disc without, without losing about an inch or two of land. Land is the real estate on the uh, lacquer that you're cutting into and it's very precious. Losing two inches of land is not good. Um, if you know about discs, towards the center you lose fidelity, so that wouldn't be awful, but I don't like the idea of not being able to cut all the way to the center of the disc. I just took an air tool with a metal bit and I just kind of carved a hole here very crudely and on this side for the adjustment so that I can, I can make this adjustment and keep this plate still. Now it's, it's looking like, because it comes back to rest on the back plane here, and what's supposed to happen is you're supposed to pull this lever and the head drops. And I don't think the head and everything else that I've built for this plate is going to be heavy enough to be able to operate that correctly. So what I'm probably going to have to do is add weights to it. In the back here, that's the dash pot, and it's just a cylinder full of oil. 
and basically a plunger and that's supposed to dampen the movements of the head and if I don't have enough weight it's not going to work and it's not going to cut to the disc. So that's the next area we're going to tackle after putting the head plate together and doing some tests. I put this spring in here completely forgetting that I had made this device to go there. Um, I might as well try them both since I have them. I have already installed the inline fuse back here. I actually even tested the audio uh, again on the on the amplifier. I finally got a solo cup. I'll try and set that up and get you some video of that. We do have audio. I didn't push it too hard because I don't want to blow up the head. <clears throat> so I'm not 100% sure what the volume is going to be, whether it's going to be usable or not. That's going to be later. I also developed this, again, very crude plate with micro switches at either end. I have yet to wire them in. I'm still kind of considering how that's going to work. That's so that when this carriage travels back this way or this way, it'll hit the limit switch, it'll stop, and I'm thinking of wiring it to lifting the head. For this specific head, I had already built a head lift that actually worked pretty well. It just didn't work with the heavier heads because it's it's very small, but we might be putting that back on there. Our other objective is going to be motor replacement because my 78, 45, and 33 are off by maybe one or two RPMs, depending on which speed we're talking about. I think 45 was the worst of them. It was either 45 or 78. I have the figures somewhere. I'll try and get some video of that. Problem being, it's on my phone. So I'm hoping that this motor replacement is going to get rid of the speed changes that we're having. Um, I don't have a whole lot of faith in it doing it, seeing as it's AC. The wave going to that motor is constantly moving. The, From what I hear, the best way to uh, eliminate that, and it makes a lot of sense, is DC because it's at a constant voltage with a constant speed. Um, this is just a test to see if those motors can be changed and it can actually be usable. If they're not, then off they go and into DC land we go. Prior to this clip, I found my uh, video recording of the Webster head test with the Solo Cup. I had to increase the gain quite a bit on that clip to be able to hear it, but we do hear volume. As far as what uh, volume we're going to get usably, that's going to come out in testing, I believe. This is the representation of the RPMs at the three different speeds of the lathe. As you can see, all three of them are struggling. That should be 78, 45, and 33. I still think 78 is the worst. Uh, 45 is too fast. I believe I tested my mono record at 45 RPM, and um, it was a flange-like effect. Uh, cool on a guitar, not cool on a record. The, as you can see, the 33 is also struggling. That these figures don't look like they'd be that far off, but that amount is enough to screw with playback. We want 78, 45, and 33. There's some decimal after 33, 45, and 78. I don't have those figures right now, but once we get these new motors installed, we'll, we'll do this RPM test again. This is a, a phone app that you just put your phone on the turntable and it reads the RPMs and it's fairly accurate. So maybe these new motors will give us some usable speeds and it won't sound like we're in a flange tunnel. I had to remove the motor 
and the plate holding the motor because we're going to have to construct a brand new plate uh, to hold the new motor. The new motor is twice as big and probably I wouldn't say twice as heavy but it's heavier. So I'm my goal is to make the uh, motor support without modifying the original uh, integrity of the of the lathe. We're also going to replace the 45. I want to replace 45 and 33 because those are the most important speeds. The 78 um, with the price of these motors I don't see myself using it enough to validate it. Uh, if ever a motor came along at a good price I'd probably pick it up but they somebody must have caught on to these and they're pretty ridiculous. So I've taken that motor down you can see it there and the plate that used to hold it because we're going to modify a new plate to stick the motor in that capacitor is going to have to change and we're going to have to pull all that wiring. Here's the 45 RPM plate for the new motor. I did not video me creating this because time is kind of at a premium for me as of late. Uh, I also took a break from doing audio projects for a while. So that was during this time when I was just kind of inching along. <clears throat> it's not perfect as you can see but it works so far. It fits. We can always if this ends up working a hundred percent I can always take it apart build another one. It's just some scrap metal that I cut up. We also did this plate which I also did not film. I apologize. It actually came out pretty close to center. That's not bad for not having precision machinery. I just kind of freehanded it and hoped for the best. Uh, th this motor I had originally intended to fit into a uh, motor block so I kind of sanded down the fins a little bit to try to get it in there but I ended up having this idea instead and I think I like it better because that motor block would have taken a lot more modification than this did. This is just a piece of aluminum that I scored right where I was going to put the bend and I bent it and how I did that is I bought a cheapo um, metal brake from a very ubiquitous uh, store that tends to sell cheap tooling and of course it wasn't strong enough to bend it but it was a good platform to clamp it and I just pulled it by hand to that shape and it came out pretty good and then the rest of it I just kind of placed it and traced the bolt holes that came out 95 percent of the way there I had to cut a relief for the existing motor bracket to fit into because I didn't really want to chop it. I don't I don't like modifying the integrity of, of older equipment like this if I can avoid it. The way I did this hole for this to fit into I found a hole saw that fit into here but I didn't use it to go all the way through I just used the drill bit to put the center there. Then after the drill bit went through, I took it out, being very careful to make sure that the hole saw didn't go into the metal, and I got another hole saw that was this size. And I used that center hole I drilled to make the bigger hole. My problem was I bought a hole saw that I thought was going to be good for that, and it wasn't. So it made somewhat of a mess. And you can see I missed the gap by a little bit, but I compensated for it. I've only got one screw holding the motor in right now. I'm kind of afraid to drill the rest, but at some point I will. As I said, this looks pretty on center. It looks to me from here, it's maybe a, a centimeter to the left of where it should be, but that motor coupling is rubber and I think it'll be okay until I can come up with maybe a version 2 of this. My other issue is going to be that these wires aren't long enough to make it to the motor terminal block. So I'm going to have to extend them with some cable that I have laying around. I don't think it'll be a problem with the motor as long as I don't solder it in a terrible way. 
uh, a little longer lead probably won't hurt it. This is the wiring diagram I got with the new motors and it matches the old motors exactly. We have five wires and they're getting terminated to three different points. The black and blue stay together. Black and blue with the yellow trace they stay together. The black and the blue go to the capacitor and on my device that uh, terminal block sits in between this capacitor and it connects to the line on the other side of the terminal block. If we look at the old connections, I marked them before I removed them. This is going to be your black and blue with the yellow trace on the wire because they're both terminated to a single point. One and two are going to be between your capacitors and that's going to be just the normal black and blue. And then the other wire is obviously your ground. I'm going to test this spindle outside of the transmission. It's kind of blurry. It's focusing on the wrong thing. I don't know how to get it to focus on the spindle. But you can see that flat is spinning towards us. So when we put this new motor in, we want it to go rotate the same direction. One other point that I never noticed before because this was always in the transmission is that spindle seems to jump. It's almost like the whole motor seems to jump at the, uh, at the start. Which I wonder if there's a way we could reduce that, but that's for another day. I got the new motor in with the plate and we connected it in the same fashion that the old motor was. Again, as you watch the flat, it's spinning towards us. That's the direction the old motor was spinning as well. It's a little noisy, probably because it's on the platform. If I lift it, the noise changes, which means when I install this 100%, it won't be as noisy. We also don't have any weirdness in the wire in the wiring. No smoke, no fire. This should be good to go. What a mess. As I take things apart and tend to work on them, I start to see things that I did previously, and I want to change them. So I've taken a couple steps backwards, and. Um, Try, try to adjust the mistakes that I made the first time. This is the plate that we talked about earlier in the video. I've made it so that all three terminals are to a terminal board and I can wire it normally open or normally closed depending on my needs. I'm also going to be placing a second set of contacts underneath once I get some parts so I can uh, wire them to the lift solenoid and that's that's created quite a bit of problems because I'm not exactly sure how that's going to interact with the uh, motor speed at this point it, it, it got complicated but for the time being I can at least wire in the switches to the outer and inner limits of the record and that'll that'll work for now I created this post that I'm going to be putting onto my plate for the lift solenoid because I wired the lift solenoid and it doesn't um, it doesn't stay fired and that's not going to be useful to us. It uh, continues to cycle and it'll just make the head rock back and forth and that's not what we want. So my thought in the meantime, this isn't a permanent situation, is that I'll just have the solenoid here to fire that lift switch and lift the head at either end of the, the record. I'll also have on the button panel down here, which isn't here right now, I'll have a lift switch that I can press to lift it at any time. I say it's temporary because I don't like the operation of it. I want something smoother. I'm still working on that.
As I was taking things apart, I wanted to have a stylus light, and I temporarily connected it to my microscope light, and I have enough I have enough amperage there to power the both of them, and they'll be both intermittently turned on, very rarely turned on at the same time. So I'm going to tap off of the plate that I built that goes underneath the plinth for the sty the uh, microscope light as well as the stylus light. But when I took that plate apart I didn't like the way that I built it before. I've now modified it. it I kind of cut it very crudely as I do and had some sharp edges. I got rid of those. I gave it a little rubber backing. The transformer used to be mounted here. I moved it back here and put rib nuts in there for easy removal because this goes in under the plinth back against the the back wall of the plinth and then gets secured to the plinth. I also created, I had this um, terminal block here for the transformer before and the power coming in but I added this second terminal block for the stylus and the microscope so that if I need to take all of this apart I can very easily take it apart. When I first moved the lathe uh, somebody had just lifted the plinth and ripped the wires out of the transformer. I had to repair that with some hot glue as you can see and some new wiring and to avoid that situation again I wanted something that I could disconnect and then completely remove the plinth for maintenance purposes. Originally I started trying to cut on lacquer and I, it didn't go well and my vacuum suction tube wasn't up to snuff. I played with it a little while and I, I eventually came to the conclusion that I was skipping rungs on the ladder. So I'm now I'm going to be trying to emboss into polycarbonate with the Radiotone head. The Radiotone is basically a Webster rebranded. And in order to, to emboss from everything that I, I read, static is a problem. So I, I made this platform for my anti-static unit and I tried to move it in as close as I could. Uh, I'm also going to heat it with our lamp that I built. Um, I don't like how that the lamp is basically on top of the anti-static unit. I'm going to try and move that stuff around. The idea is to rotate the record for a while with both of those on, heat it up, get rid of some of the static, and then drop the embossing cone onto the surface of the record and, and uh, emboss our sound. I think I was trying to cut into material before with diamond and I, I feel like that's two or three rungs above embossing and I should start at embossing. I also built a removable weight platform for the head because it wasn't really coming down and sitting well. It was kind of rocking back, back up which made me think that there wasn't enough weight. I modified the cover that I put on the dash pot in the back because it was rubbing and I thought that had something to do with the the motion of the cutter head. After I modified that and made the hole a little bigger it it didn't really change anything. So my thought is this head is too small it doesn't have enough weight for the carriage to rock back even with the plate. I did some more audio tests with our our different heads uh, I've got a couple to play with right now. And something that I definitely needed to incorporate was a inverse RIAA filter. I purchased one of those. It was just the bare PCB. It was already stuffed, so I didn't have to do too much with that. Um, I probably could have built it. I didn't really want to. I just wanted it ready to go. So I put it in this fancy little case. Added a, a power light and a switch and we've got it running. It's kind of temporary, that's why the lid's not on it. I do have a lid. I actually went and painted it. Look at me. And um, 
I, I tested the heads with it. I noticed that I got a much cleaner sound, and that's because we increased the headroom by not clogging it with uh, big, huge bass waves that the head can't really replicate anyway. That's I think that's the purpose of the inverse RIAA. You cut the lows and the highs, a little bit of the highs, and then the actual RIAA filter within whatever playback device you're using compensates for that. That was a crucial thing that I was missing before. I'd heard about it, I just I just never got it, I guess. It makes a big difference from the couple of heads that I tested. I also, when I was setting things up, I noticed that I don't have any monitoring. I have audio monitoring, but I don't have any levels. So I built this little platform to take over the swing door. I put a new uh, DC power supply for the, the stylus heater in here, one that I could take apart and build into a platform. And going into these two empty holes over here is two VU meters. I'm going to have an input and an output. How accurate those are going to be, I'm not really 100% sure. But it's going to give me an idea that level is coming in. And that's, uh, that's something I need. I had an issue where I wasn't sure. And it was wasting a lot of time trying to figure out whether my head had a problem or I just wasn't getting audio back to the head. This spaghetti you see hanging before you is all of the things that I talked about implementing. I got them working in sort of a temporary basis. I now have to stuff it all back into the can and and get it nice in here. Uh, we did get the switches to work after that. I can demonstrate that a little later. The head lift, we went through multiple different iterations of it. I finally settled on a continuous duty um, magnet that turns on with uh, with a voltage. And I, I still have to wire it into the second set of contacts. I also have to build a platform for it. So that little, that little platform that we had up here, the idea of that, I think that might be going to the wayside. We're probably not going to go that direction. This other one is continuous duty. And it doesn't get hot. What I experienced with my little platform and my plunger is it's not continuous duty and no matter how you change the voltage, how low you go with the voltage, I tried multiple different supplies, it still got hot over time ever so slowly with the lower voltages. It just it probably isn't going to be an option. My other idea is I've got it functioning where I can turn the volume on or off. The, I can't seem to get the volume pot to work. This is going to be basically a uh, announcement panel to say, yes, uh, audio is coming in. You don't have a problem on the audio end. So I can that and I can turn this on and kind of get an idea, checking levels before I send it to my head. This this video is kind of elongated, and it might seem like I'm trying to. Uh, make it longer than it should be to gain minutes, but I promise you that it's not. This process is not very straightforward. You can do a lot of years and years of reading and trying to figure out how to how to emboss a record and still not get there. So I, I promise you I'm not milking this for everything it's worth. I'm actually I'm just discovering things that need to change before I'm getting to the point of embossing a record. So we've reached the half hour limit on this. I'm going to start another video and I'm hoping that in the next video we get to the point of embossing the record. I'm going to take care of all the things that I, I had talked about doing. I uh, got it getting everything over there into the can and making sure everything works. And then I'll start the, the second video and try and cut to the chase a little faster. It's it's just this process is long and and tedious and there's a lot of things that you'll you'll think you're almost there and then something will come up and you need a solution for it to continue to do it at, at least with any sort of accuracy. Uh, some of the things that I need to change I want the whole lathe to run on a circuit breaker 
there's these two ginormous fuses underneath there that are uh, seemingly hard to get a hold of in that rating because everything nowadays is is twice the, the amperage and it's it's a big industrial fuse at a really low rating which sounds like you should be able to find it at a hardware store you can't now i'm sure i could if i did a whole lot of digging i'm sure i could find a place to get them and play around with that and get a whole box of them i'd rather just put it on a few on a, a circuit breaker that uh, when i have a problem it breaks and i just reset it i'm not a big fan of buying batteries and fuses and things of that nature i'd rather just go the easy cheap route in order to do that um, i've already got the equipment i need to test the inrush current of the new motors and make sure that my amperage setting is correct on my circuit breaker because I can set I can set it to a couple of different settings. Uh, there's a couple other things that I, I'm going to take care of. I'll document them in the next video, and hopefully in this next video we'll have all the uh, materials together, and I'll actually film embossing a record on this lathe. It's going to be difficult I've never done it before I, I I read that there's a lot of there's a learning curve there and I'm fully expecting it I'll put that to video and take you along on that journey no matter how frustrating it is hopefully it won't take three years this time thanks for watching and stay tuned for the next installment